how did you come to your practice in yoga okay. first and um, how did you get to practice with Iyengar? At first I was in London and I was always fascinated by two words, yoga and Zen. And I was ooh, about 15 and a half at the time. And I was walking around a square near Oxford Street and I saw a sign saying yoga. So I went in a little basement and there was a lovely South African lady there who was a student of Sir Paul Dukes. And I started going to the classes and she had a man friend who was quite a learned man in philosophy, in, more in philosophy than in yoga And then after about three or four weeks, he said to me, I'm taking you out for dinner. So we went out for dinner and there was another young Indian boy with him. And the boy was a student of a very famous yogi called Diharandra Brahmachari. And we had dinner together in a little Hare Krishna type restaurant. And it was then arranged, the whole idea was for me to go back with this boy to India. So after going, getting my visa, some money from my parents, off I went to the Himalayas, up into Kashmir. Quite a journey, you can imagine this is like 1964, 65. And I stayed and lived up there, uh, practicing and learning from Diharanda Brahmachari, with the visits back to UK to see my parents. And then I then went on to stay in America for a little while, and I taught in a couple of health centers there. But I wasn't happy in New York. I came back to London, then I went back to India and to Thailand and I met a friend, an American guy called Justin and he said, hey, I'm studying in India with BKS Iyengar, why don't you go there? So I knew one of his contacts in London so I contacted them and they gave me a letter and I turned up and there I stayed for literally almost 20 years with again the odd trip to London and the odd trip to Goa. And Guruji used to laugh at me and tease me. Huh, where are you going? Goa again? Because it became more and more regular that I was staying in Pune, but making more and more trips to Goa. Because Pune became such a crowded, chaotic city. Uh, but it wasn't long trips in Goa. And I'd get a call, hey, when are you coming back? And that's how it all came about. And with BKS Iyengar, he was so kind, so humble, and of course his English to perfection. Whilst with Brahmachari, his English was poor. So it was a struggle to understand at times, and especially being the first and only Westerner up there. So coming back to Pune, I used to be at the Institute every day, studying in the class with his son Prashanji, who is a block of the father, absolutely a gem. And that's how it all came about. And because I was living in India and being here, I was more than, I was accepted as like Ian from India. Not Ian, English Ian. So it was always like Ian, India. And if Guruji went anywhere within India where he loved to go for temple visits, Always myself and Swamiji Rudra from Rishikesh used to accompany him. And what a personality he was. And if there was a visit to a temple, he was there before we were. And he used to love going to temples and he used to walk so fast to go into the temple. We used to have to run to keep up with him. But his kindness to everybody was what was so wonderful. He talked with everybody, it doesn't matter whether you're rich, poor, made no difference to him. And he came from a very, very, very poor family in a little village in Belor. And then he decided, I want to give back to my people. So he has built in Belor, and I was 
there with him from the day of the first stone foundation. He's built a school for free school for all, a small hospital and three temples. All free, everything is free. And now the trust and family members are running this Belor Center. And so he was just, he didn't want to spend money on himself. He used to shout, why are people buy, uh, buying me presents or this and that? Let them make a, a, a donation to the, to the foundation. So Guruji was often misunderstood. Yes, he was very strict and he would shout. And people would say, oh, what a temper. Yes, he did have a temper, like all have a temper. But Guruji would shout at you, and then half a second later, would bring on a smile that would make you melt. His shouting and hitting was to waken up the dead parts of the body. He knew exactly where there was inactivity within the body. So when Guruji pressed you, or hit you, or jumped on you, was to awaken that dead area. Only he could do that. Others tried to and copy him. It's not. So he was just a sweetheart to everybody and a lover of cricket. He would talk on all aspects. And you have to remember, he had no education. So how this command of knowledge is incredible. And to read his books and the wording with no education and such wording. Another thing wonderful about Guruji, I'm taking away the aspects now of all this yoga practice, all, because everybody will tell you about that. I'm going to give you the other side of Guruji. You wrote to Guruji a letter. Guruji replied the same day. The same day. You wrote to him about something. Every afternoon, he sat in his office, in the basement, in the library, and every day he dictated and replied to letters. And if he was late a few days, he would apologize to you. Look at Arun's book and you read, you've just had the experience of one of the finest teachers you'll ever go to. And read the back page where Guruji apologized of how he gave the book back because he couldn't, he had to separate things because he couldn't lift it. So Guruji, there was no jealousy, nothing in him. He was just so kind-hearted and caring and he's naturally, people looked to Guruji and they thought, oh, he's for medical. Yes, he was a genius at bringing people back to, to life. I have known many stories and seen many incidents where people have come to Guruji with the most terrible of illnesses and he's cured them. But so people have got the idea, Guruji is medical man, furniture yoga. No. If you looked at his early practice, he practiced without props. How did he bring about the props? Very simply. When he first started out, Guruji used to manipulate every person himself. So now 10, 20 people in a room, very easy to go around and physically lift them, push them, but he got more and more popular. So he came up with the idea of props to make the asana for all. And that is, so when people say, oh, he's a furniture yoga, this is not yoga, he has adapted to make yoga available for all situations. And that is also one of the wonderful things. One of the greatest things about Guruji was he would say a lot of wonderful things in short sentences. I'll give you an example. One day, Guruji, myself, and his daughter Savita were in the countryside, and he loved to go to the countryside. He was outside of Bangalore, and we were at a waterfall. It was a very hot day, I think, in April. And I saw the waterfall, and we were standing there looking at this waterfall, rushing down. And he said to me, your mind is like that. You see the lake at the bottom? You have to bring your mind down to that. So he often talked with little sentences, but with great meaning. He tried to make 
difficult thing simple. Whilst his son, the other genius, was the exact is the exact opposite. He will make simple things difficult. So each one, and that's basically it. And he was devoted to his practice. He practiced every morning. He was there at five to nine, sitting at the steps downstairs, waiting for the students to come down from the seven to nine of the o'clock class of Prashant, so that we all could say hello, bow down, or say hi to Guruji, uh, pay our respects. And then he would go up, take off his clothes, he's got his yoga shorts on, bare-chested, and straight into practice. And he rarely came out of the practice room till 12 o'clock. And within that period of the three hours or so he practiced, he would always find half an hour or so to stop, sit down, and talk with everybody. And also pick out somebody and say, hey, and bring the person up and say, you're doing this wrong, and explain to us why, what, not just this is wrong, do this, no. why, how. And then he would often relate stories of what has happened to him, bits of knowledge. And then when he felt that's enough, we've had enough, up again he goes straight back into his practice. And to watch him practice, even just in Shavasan, how we used to lie there, how the hands were placed, how the eyes were, it was just... So you can look at a yogi and watch them do all the acrobatic things. Watch them in Shavasan. Then you see what is a yogi. You and I might have been ballet dancers or gymnasts or double jointed. So some people can get into an asana, put their legs here, legs here, yoga nidra, do whatever. That's not yoga. You used to shout at people and say, you're not doing yoga, you're doing gymnastics, or you're doing boga, showing off. And often, people would come where he's practicing, try and be close to him, and try and show off. I'm doing this very advanced asana, Goji. He would tell them. He says, you see that little old woman at the back of the corner? And he would look through a crowd of maybe 40 people practicing. She's doing yoga. Elderly lady, she can barely move her fingers, but she's doing yoga. You're doing showing off to me. And also, one of the great things about Guruji is he's got photographs on the wall, all around the wall of him, in all different asanas. But there's one thing common in every one of the asana. His face is the same. Quiet, calm, serene, sublime face. We do an asana, we've got to pulling our teeth here, lips here, tongue here, fighting, everything. Guruji, every asana, he brought in the calmness, the serenity of the asana. So he had the same face, whether it, whichever asana. That is the difference between Guruji in the asana practice than us. And he was just, he was a father to everybody. And then he brought up, he turned Prashant, um, who are all his two children, and they have been, were his arms, his pillars. So, and that is basically how it all came about. And then since his passing, the institute is running very well, run by his granddaughter, who he knew he was passing away. And so for the last six months or a year, he gave so much attention and teachings to Abhijata so that she could carry on running with his son because Gita passed away a year ago now and the institute. Do you still visit it? I visit it from time to time. Mm. You know. But now I'm based down here. I do go out from time to time to visit. Mm. It always brings back such memories. And just recently uh, the head of the institute um, sent me a photo of me, Guruji, and a couple of others from about 30 years ago, and it brought back such wonderful memories. It's very beautiful to hear, really. Um, I would love to, love to restore it.
Um, what's also interesting for us is you're practicing a long time now. And, um, uh, how would you describe the change over the years or with age, how to deal with it? You have to come to terms with the changes. Uh, a lot of people cannot and suffer and say, oh, I could do this years ago, I can't do it now. Yes, there's many asanas which are much, much more difficult, much more challenging than from the days before. The body ages. Uh, it, but come to terms with it. Accept this is your situation. And learn to accept and learn to develop and customize your practice as to what is right for you at this situation in time. Your age, the climate, is all great importance to how one practices. And if you try to be like you were 30 years ago, you're only going to end up having tension with it. And this as happens unfortunately to so many old people, they can't, not only with yoga, with life, with everything. You have to accept today's situation. This is how it is now. Forget how it was years ago. Otherwise, you're always going to... Same thing with places. Let's take Pune, for example. When Guruji first lived there, the street where the institute was called, is called Hare Krishna Mandir Road was the most beautiful tree-lined road you could imagine, with barely a car. Now, it's like a highway. Same thing with life, you have to. Same thing with even you today, with your practice. Are you practicing in India? Are you practicing in the cold of Germany? Um, how, are, how are you today? Um, you have a toothache. How are you gonna practice? Or, after, you know after a class, you've got a dentist appointment. Your mind is not going to be the same. So each, you have to, each time you go into practice, as to how the situation is. Naturally, being here in India, everything opens up much better with the heat. Whilst we go back to Germany, you're looking at the clock. Oh, I've got to finish, I've got to go to work. Big difference. Here in India, is more, where, might, where should I go and have a breakfast? Big, big difference. And as to how your situation is, have you two had a fight? You're not gonna be in the same mood. Has he just bought you a diamond ring? You're gonna be in a different mood. So you have to accept each situation. And each time you do an asana, it is how it is now. Not how it was last week, two days ago. You've flown home to Germany, you're jet lagged. How was the practice? You've flown into India, you've had four hours, four days rest. How was your practice? You're coming to see a new teacher. How was the excitement? Back in Germany, the phone rings, or there's post with the electricity bill. Oh, wow. How am I gonna pay that bill? Big difference. And with aging, we're all going to age. So you have to adapt, and that's where, of course, the props come in and help you. As you've seen in my classes, with the props, it helps you to put yourself in a position where there is an ease and comfort in the pose so that the breath can flow. So the breath can flow through all the cells of the body. So trying, as an old age, to struggle damage comes. As age comes, the hips, the knees, everything ages. It's a natural, the organs. So with the breath, we can revitalize the organs in our body. That's why you often see yogis live so long through the breath. And Diharanja Brahmachari and all the yogis used to tell you, we don't count your years, you are how old is by how many breaths. So basically, come to terms with it. You're going to struggle. Everybody's going to have a time. My hair's growing grey. My hair's falling out. And my bottom's getting fatter. Lady, my thighs are getting bigger. The men, my waist is getting a beer belly look. This is natural. You can't always be 16. 
be 16 maybe in mind. And as Prashant used to say, wisdom only comes when the hairs start coming grey. So I'm actually, in fact, the worst person to interview because I only have a few grey hairs. <laughs> so I haven't got the wisdom yet that um, is required. But they say wisdom comes with the grey hairs. And Guruji had beautiful head and grey hair. And so does Prashant. Thank you. Thank you.